It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Tim Foskett, one of our clinical associates that I've known since the early 80s, a very long time, a very long time, uh, who's been pioneering incredible work with gay men around groups, gay and bi men around groups, and beyond now. And we're going to hear about that. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited to hear you speak. So take it away, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah, at the back, you're good. A bit louder. We'll see what we can do. We're going to try and have the slides here and here so that everyone can see. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, It Takes a Queer Village. Um, the therapeutic effects of large group experiences for gay and bi men. Um, I'm going to tell you a lot about that. I see it as a phenomenon, and uh, I'll tell you some about the history of that. Um, first thing to say is that uh, the, the phrase gay and bi men doesn't, doesn't do it justice, because some of the people that come to our events uh, don't identify as gay or bi, but nevertheless come to our events. Um, and some of the people that come to our events don't identify as men. So it's actually difficult to find a language that precisely works with this community. GSRD doesn't do it because we are a, a, a subset. So I'm going to use those words. I'm going to use the word queer sometimes. Um, you understand there's, there's quite an array of people that we're talking about here. And I just want to say one thing about the word queer. Um, because I work a lot with gay and bi men, I know that there are some gay men, particularly, who find the word queer very difficult, very painful. It's a, it's a trigger word for a lot of people. It was associated with very severe trauma for a lot of people for a very long time. I use it. I think it's a good word. I, I think it's good that we've reclaimed it. But I, I want to acknowledge that it's not an easy word for some of the community that I work with. So, um, moving on. Um, it takes a queer village, and here we are in a queer village. Um, I, I wanted to acknowledge just what a queer village pink therapy is and has been for so many of us over so, so many years. And lots of the features that I talk about in the work that we've been doing and other people have been doing are exactly the features that are characteristic of what happens here. The connections, the friendships, the mentoring, the stories, the sharing, all sorts of things have happened to many of us at Pink Therapy over decades, so we're, we're, li we're living in an example of what I want to talk about. <laughs> I want to start with a little poem. Many of you will know this poem. It's about wild geese. <clears throat> you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles tr through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the, of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies, and the deep trees, the mountains, and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no, ha no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. And it's the, the phrase family of things, announcing your place in the family of things, that I, I was touched by thinking about this work. That I think one of the things that large groups give us as queer people is almost the first experience of seeing ourselves in a queer family of things and where we are within that family. Um, my first experience of a queer village of a kind was the NUS, uh, as it was in those days, lesbian and gay campaign. I was 19 years old in 1985, I think in Manchester University. And it was an extraordinary experience for me to meet in a group about this size, maybe a bit younger, <laughs> on the, on the medium, um, of, of LG and other, actually, activists, um, and talk about our, our queerness in different ways. And I remember the experience of doing that in daylight. Like, I'd been to gay pubs, I'd been to gay clubs, but I'd never been with other lesbian and gay people in daylight before. 
And I'd never spent more than a few hours before with those people. And we were coming back day after day. And something like my head exploded a little bit. And of course, we know since the decades that that happened from all the neurobiology that we now understand that my head, probably something in my head did explode. There was a release, probably. There was a neural pathway that began to uh, experience something completely novel, to be with my peers for the first time. And various other things happened, and then about 10 years later, I went to an Edward Carpenter Community Week. Edward Carpenter is one of the communities that I want to mention today. Um, and here I am, I'm the one with the curly hair, Talking, talking to a couple of the elders in that, in that group. Ted is on the top, he, he sadly died last year. And Phil Parkinson was one of the facilitators of, um, of that week. Um, a well-known queer therapist to many of us, I'm sure. Um, at the end of that experience of being with about 60 mostly gay men, in the Lake District, um, I wrote a little poem. It's called Mirrors of Myself. Three lines, very simple. Who I once was, who I am today, who I may become. And again, it was extraordinary to see this range of people that had something to do with me. Um, and particularly, actually, I remember being really taken by the, the older men there. That there was something about how they lived. The, they lived outside a box that I didn't even know existed, some of them. And it was extraordinary to meet them as a young-ish gay man at that time. And move on. So this is one of my difficult segues. I'm going to talk about the history in a minute. Uh, but I wanted to say something about why might, this, why might these groups have formed? Why might these things be important? And I want to read a, a piece of text from an article about homophobia and the, particularly the impact of homophobic trauma on gay men, written by somebody in this audience, Stuart Stevenson. I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up, but, no. but it's a beautiful piece of writing, as Stuart's work always is. So, homophobia is a hatred of intimate and sexual relationships between people of same sex and of the same sex and of those who reject aspects of gender conformity. It is a deep-seated attitude damaging to the one who hates and the one who is hated. It often involves acts of treachery and betrayal towards vulnerable children, adolescents and adults. Although primarily aimed at people who are LGBTQ plus IA, homophobia is also an attack on human connection and understanding. It grows out of and is sustained by toxic masculinity, misogyny, and gender binarism. It has a wide arc from microaggressions to murder and can range from a mean-spirited absence of reciprocity or mutuality to something more violent, seeking to attack potency in mind, body, and spirit. The experience of homophobia cuts deep and gnaws away subtly at your sense of self, making you the receptacle of a poisonous hatred which leaves you feeling excluded, unlovable, and an object of disgust. Homophobia can be internalized in feelings of shame, despair, and self-hatred, and can lead to dangerously self-destructive self -destructive acting out. It can take up tenancy in the minds and lives of members of the LGBTQIA plus community, poisoning intimate relationships and curtailing free oh, sorry, poisoning intimate relationships and curtailing freedom of mind. I think it's easy in the airbrushed um, Netflix story of gay men to forget that this went on, goes on and that people live with the residue of this, even if their lives don't particularly look like it at some level. Um, of course, this is true for pretty much all queer people, but I, I wanna just, obviously the work that we're talking about today is to do with gay and bi men, principally. And I think that this movement, I do see it as a movement of different kinds of large group experiences, is in some ways an antidote to that poison 
I'll, I'll talk about why I think there's an, you'll see why there's an antidote. But I think that's a good way of thinking it. That if we have been poisoned, we need an antidote. And this is one of the ways in which some of us have found that antidote. And one of the big aspects of that poison is masculinity, maleness, how we are policed to perform maleness all through our life cycle from, from age zero. And the work that then needs to happen if we want to live an authentic life. Enormous work that needs to happen if we want to live an authentic life. Remembering um, Alan Down's model in Velvet Rage, he talked about three phases, many people will know them. The first is being overwhelmed by shame, and that many queer men are living in an experience of being overwhelmed by shame. If we're lucky enough to move through that phase to phase two, we move into overcompensating for shame. So I have to have the best job, the best um, body, the best boyfriend, the biggest house, this kind of idea. And lots of variations in that. But if you think about your own life and how do we, how we yeah, overcompensate in some sort of public relations kind of way. And only if we choose to, to work through that do we get to stage three, authenticity. What it is to be an authentic human being um, in, a, in a gay, male, or bi experience of life. What, what, what authenticity looks like. I guess some of what happened to me at the Edward Carpenter week I went to in 96 was I saw some examples of of queer authenticity that I had not seen before. In the events that I'm going to talk about in a moment, um, there are people from all of those three phases, overwhelmed, overcompensating, and exploring authenticity. And of course, we all move backwards and forwards between those phases anyway. And I think these events need to be organized around uh, with the reality, recognizing the reality of that. This is a nice little campaign that somebody did a few years ago, reframing standard tropes around masculinity, and I find this one touching. So I said I'd share some history. I'm going to run through some of the gatherings and organizations that I'm thinking of. The first of those um, is the Radical Fairies. Um, set up in, well, the first gathering of Radical Fairies was in the States in 1979. Uh, it was set up by these two people, Harry Hay and John Burnside, and a third person, Don Kilhefner. Harry Hay is famous for um, creating the first gay, well, in those days, homosexual organization in 19, 1950 in America, the Mattachin Society. For people who are interested in queer history, the Mattachines were 17th century dancers who played with gender. And he took that name and called, created the Mattachine Society. In, he resigned only three years after he helped to create it because he couldn't, couldn't handle, couldn't abide uh, the assimilationist model that was adopted by that organization that really was looking at one plus one living in a white picket fence house. That was, that was the, the level of demand, really, that the Mattachine Society wanted. And Harry Hay, even in 1953, he, he was a communist who's very much part of the counterculture. He, he said, queer people have so much more to offer than that. And if we just go for that, the, the, the universe will lose out all of the rest of what we have to offer. And, and so the, the vision of the Radical Fairies was born. The first, there were various things that happened, but the first proper meeting happened in 1979. Um, I don't know how much people know about the Radical Fairies. Very interesting movement all over the world. Um, um, very colourful, very drag, very queer, very gender, gender playing. Um, lots of Radical Fairies choose their own uh, fairy name. In the early days, they were almost always in the femme category. It was nearly always men. These days, it's a bit more of an open community. Everyone is welcome who, who identifies and wants to be there. This is a farm in eastern France that is owned by a network of fairies in, in Europe, a very large network. We all put money in, and this is called Voltaire. And the organization that owns it is Les Amis de Voltaire. Um, extraordinary space and a group of people. Lots of, lots of gatherings of 
40, 50, sometimes 100, sometimes more. I think one in America uh, has 400 people at um, over the May, one of the May Bank holidays in America. So going chronologically, the next organisation that I came across um, was, is Adodi, which uh, Wayne Mertens Brown is going to be speaking a little bit about this afternoon. I believe he's well enough to do that for us. Um, formed in 1983, uh, specifically for black gay men, still going strong, lots of chapters, lots of events, he'll tell us more. Body Electric, a um, bit different uh, educational establishment, but also a community teaching erotic massage, uh, eroticism to men. Um, I was struck by how many of these organizations began in the 80s, and then I realized that, of course, they began in the 80s. Um, it, it was in, in part to do with HIV and to do with safe spaces for men to come together and handle uh, the, what was going on for them. Um, but it's also to do with the number of years of queer, queerness being legal, feminism, the counterculture. You know, there's a, there's a process here. So it's fascinating that so many of these organizations began in the 80s. The next one is the Roe Labor Day Retreat. It happens upstate New York. 125 men meet there regularly. Uh, been going for a very long time. The Ebu Carpenter community that I mentioned began in 1985-ish. There was a bit of something before it, and then it, it formalized in 1985. Still going strong, mostly in the UK. Um, there's a, a retreat center in upstate New York called Eastern Mountain, wonderful place, a queer spiritual center, mostly focused on gay and bi men, but not only, um, big vision, lot, many, many people go through there every year. Our work began in 2003, um, founded by myself, Dennis Carney and Alfred Hurst. Uh, Dennis retired a couple of years ago from our work, sadly. Alfred and I are still there, and we have other people involved now. I want to do a shout out to Tracy Wolf, who is in Norwich watching this presentation. Tracy was the administrator of PACE at the time that we set up Loving Men and was very important to uh, making it all come true. So, sending <laughs> you love, Trace. Um, Tantra for Gay Men, uh, UK based but has emigrated to the United States to do lots of erotic work. Uh, I think. I would call it Neo-Tantra. Obviously, Tantra is an ancient and vast spiritual practice. Neo-Tantra is some people taking aspects of that and applying it in the, in the contemporary time. The Quest, based in London, does work in the UK, uses a lot of Brené Brown's ideas, uh, cultivates a community for people, an educational program and community again. The Stretch Festival in Berlin has been around for uh, eight years now, maybe a bit longer. Um, it, they, they run festivals two or three times a year in Berlin, but they also run a place called The Village, signified at the top there. Uh, it's, a, it's a permanent space, a permanent community space in Berlin. All sorts of amazing things happen there. Human-friendly, developmental things. Uh, queer community. Uh, big um, cohort of trans men involved in that community as well as gay and bi men. Very, very interesting, very exciting work. So zooming out from just from gay bi men, just wanted to mention trans burial. I think someone was going to speak to that. Maybe someone will speak to that a little bit later on. Um, just thought it was interesting. There's another group of men meeting on a collective basis to do developmental work. Obviously not all of them are gay or bi. But some of them are. Um, so that zooming out from the gay bi experience and again zooming out a bit more queer queer spirit festival i think is in this uh, stable as it were um big gathering 150 60 people i think another one planned for next year um very diverse in all kinds of ways if you fancy a bit of that and zooming out even from the queer lens to acknowledge um something called menfest which uh is open to anyone who identifies with the word man or male. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's an interesting place. There's some very good uh, aff affirmative work around queer men. Also has a significant number of black men, men of color involved. Uh, consciousness around diversity, even though the majority of people there are straight men. 
straight assessment. And I also wanted to mention, because I came across it recently, uh, a space in Lesbos um, owned by a collective of women. Um, Leah, has, Leah has visited and will be available for questions later. Um, it's a very new project, but very ambitious ideas to build um, queer community, um, and in particular for women on Lesbos. So it gives you a sense of some of the range that we're talking about, and you probably can see why I see this as some sort of movement, and not a flash in the pan. Some of these organizations are celebrating their 40, 40 year birthdays. So. so what happens at these events? Well, I tried to sort of capture a few ideas. So first of all, there's, very, there's a very warm welcome. I think this is very important for, for queer people in general. We, we have had so many experiences of being unwelcome or of not being embraced or understood or, you know, going back to two years old, perhaps, over and over again, not quite in the right place, not quite the right walk, Jaron was talking about, not quite the right this, not quite the right that. So I would say it's a feature of all of these organisations that there's warmth in the room and there's welcome in the room. There's also space for hanging out, for living together, for rubbing up against each other. And I don't actually necessarily mean that sexually. Like, just the hangout, I think, is really important. Um, but like I said, about day, being in daylight with each other and coming back the next day and having a hangover or having a different mood than yesterday and the relationship that comes from that. Mm. These are some images from Loving Men as we go, just to give you some idea. Um, so there's often, of these, all these organizations do it a bit differently, but there's a lot of overlap. There's often workshops, consciousness raising was used earlier, support, so there's an emotional element to it, skill sharing, education, space to experiment. Um, so I would say that's a big feature of that, and I think it's a big feature of therapy outside the therapy room, is that you don't just talk about it, okay, we can experiment in the therapy room, but if you're in, in one of these events, you are experimenting with yourself Every, every minute, really. So it's a very lived experience. Most of these spaces, and what distinguishes why I'm not talking maybe about Bear Weekend or other, th other organizations, there's an invitation and some facilitation to vulnerability, authenticity, um, self-expression, sharing, uh, emotional processing. There's a lot of play at these events. And there's an aspiration towards a shame-free space rather than the shame-overloaded space that so many of us inhabit. Some pictures of some of the activities we, we might we find ourselves doing. This is a particularly famous colour color fight, I don't know what you call it. I guess a lot of that adds up to intimacy. And in that realm, a lot of these organisations focus on body or somatic practices. Sensuality is big in this world. Sex positive dialogue, narrative. There's a lot of touch. Um, and then I would say in the last few years, particularly the last few years, a focus on consent culture and a conversation about consent, um, which uh, wasn't necessarily there from the beginning. And, you know, the Me Too movement, I think, has, has rightly brought a lot of these, those issues to the forefront. And there is more of a dialogue about those issues uh, within these organizations now. I wanted to say something about sex. Um, so the first event I went to with the uh, Edward Carpenter community, one of the facilitators were lot was Lionel Reed, who also sadly no longer with us, another grandfather of person-centered queer therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and he did this talk at the beginning, and he said, one of the things that's really good about being here for a week is you get to track your nervous system for a whole week in, in community with other gay men. And he said, in his experience, the first 48 hours, there's an awful lot of hormonal activity going on. And after 48 hours, it settles down a bit. And we begin to see each other differently. And we get to know each other. And different levels of attraction come forward. Different levels of attraction move back. And there's room for that sort of thing. And I. I I found this very helpful, and I have to say that the main thing strangers to this work say, whether they're gay or whatever their sexuality, 
is, oh, I suppose there's a lot of sex, I suppose there's orgies, I suppose there's an all-night orgies. It's, it's like, I've heard that so many times. And I'm not saying that people don't have sex, and we're, we, I think all these organizations would consider themselves sex positive, but it is, it's a much smaller slice of the pie, it's a much smaller slice of what's, what's important and what's going on for people there than it is in the minds of most people thinking about it. Mm. And of course that tells us something about the world that we live in. I wanted to say something else about something, but anyway, it's gone. Okay. So the last um, little layer is um, around diversity. So obviously queer men come in all shapes and sizes, all races. Um, some of these organizations have worked really hard. I would say Loving Men is one of those organizations to, to really be a representative community. Um, and that takes a lot of work to um, be active in that. Um, one of the big challenges at the moment is the socioeconomic gulf between the people who have money and the people that don't. When we began 20 years ago, many people could afford to go and do something like this. And when I talk to younger people these days, it's like it's so far away from their reality to have even 300 quid, which would be a concessionary rate, but even 300 quid to come and do this is way beyond what people would consider possible. So we do various ways of fundraising to make that more possible, but these are the sorts of things that we need to be thinking about. Um, lots of gender fuckery, I've talked about that's the technical term, obviously. <laughs> I've already talked about that. Um, intergenerational, a uh, very important part of what we're doing. Um, a holism, um, body, mind, heart, spirit, all of that can be in there. Some of those organizations are more explicitly spiritual. I would say most of them are not explicitly spiritual. But there's a spirituality that many people are enjoying in so, at some level, um, usually quite personally. Um, a lot of it happens in nature. I think that's an interesting phenomenon. Mm. That queer men, um, oh, I've remembered what I wanted to talk about, body and why body is important. Queer men often congregate to urban. And it's interesting that a lot of these gatherings happen out of urban. Mm. Not all, but quite a lot of them. And ritual. Uh, different people have developed different kinds of ritual, um, and they're often a part of some of these events. They're very person-centered. You can join in to the extent you want to, and so on. Just going back to body. So I think it's interesting that many of these organizations have things to do with body. And of course, I think where the primary wounding is for many of us is to do with our bodies, to do with our desires, to do with our physicality. And it makes sense to me that these organizations have grown out of that and have responded by uh, engaging very strongly with body, with uh, eros, with touch, and with connection that is actually pretty rare for a lot of, a lot of gay men, conversely to the stereotype. I see we need to move on. A little bit of gender fuckery, a little bit of ritual, a little bit of intergenerational contact. Okay, so I wanted to show you two minutes of a film um, that we made a few years ago at Loving Men. And I think we're going to be able to do that at the press of a button. This is just uh, a few people sharing some of their experience so that you have some idea. The, thing, the main thing for me about Loving Men is community being with uh, other gay men, gay bisexual men, in a space where it's okay to talk about a lot of things where perhaps in other parts of my life, talking about them could be problematic. Um, there's a real sense of connection and uh, a sense of brotherhood as well, which has been really nice. Regarding the, the, the diversity of the people who attend Loving Men, it's a great variety. Um, from ethnicity to age and to health status as well. And I remember we have to stand in a circle, go from the youngest to the oldest, and we have people in their 20s, in their 30s, up to in their 80s. It's been such a nicely balanced week, you know, with just enough working on yourself, relaxation time, so much to do. Just being here is fantastic, so. Loving Men really helps you to form deeper relationships, which is not, not about sex, it's not about drugs, it's not about 
being shallow, it's something else. And that's been really important for me. But also even I think that just the whole process here is all about relationships. Um, so it's how we relate to each other and, and, and the whole and the workshops and all of that. It all is about relationships, it is about love, mm-hmm. intimacy, and maybe some sex in there too. Yes, mm-hmm. if you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that makes this event very special for me is that is the laughter. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I don't think I laugh as much as I do in one week as I do here. And I think for me that is very healing and very therapeutic. Mm. Um, and it's something that uh, I look forward to every year. I learn about humanity. And I learn about diversity. I learn about uh, integrity. And, uh, and I was moved about the, the willingness to connect as uh, human beings. So I would say that's the essence of loving men, about meeting others, doing things with others, finding out about yourself. Um, and hopefully those contacts will continue after. And, we, and I think that happens. And, and I've heard of people, you know, who've made really good friendships that way. And, um, and, and even we've had a few loving men weddings as well. <laughs> the experience was quite moving. I, um, I think it was a a week where I really shifted the way I lived my life after having that week, after interacting with gay men in a different kind of way, a way that I didn't think was possible. So uh, the person who spoke about laughter was Dennis, Dennis Carney, he was one of the founders, and the person who spoke about weddings is Alfred also known as Willow, one of the other founders, just so you know who they are. Health warning. So, large group gatherings are not for everyone. Uh, They will stretch your comfort zone. They're designed to stretch your comfort zone. They can be challenging physically, emotionally, mentally. They're demanding in some ways. They can be a kind of flooding, if you go back to that. I think outdated technique, but still happens. Um, although we work really hard on, uh, on making them inclusive, safe, bigotry, prejudice free, we, we, cannot, we cannot make that. That is a work in progress. That is a community in progress, process. So they're not utopias. They're not perfectly safe. They're not, they're not free from homophobia, let alone racism, transphobia, or any of the others. And, and yet, I think what we have managed over many years is to cultivate a dialogue around that, to, to do educational work around that. Um, and because we're quite a diverse community, it just comes up in the course of things. Um, but it is an ongoing piece of work. And being part of them involves self-regulating and a lot of co-regulation. There's a lot of support structures built in to our work, um, but they're not for everyone. So. Um, I think it's worth knowing that and saying that. Um, The word emotional roller coaster is sometimes used by people who do this. I'm putting you all off, aren't I now? But you get you get the idea (laughs) that it's something to weigh up with people, and there needs to be a certain amount of readiness for that. I think if that if people want to come, I want to talk now just briefly to end about what I think is therapeutic about some of this or what the therapeutic aspects of this might be and to use some of our therapeutic knowledge. Um, Talked about holism and I think one of the great advantages of an intense workshop is you can't escape yourself. I think it's Thich Nhat Hanh who said, we live in communities in order to come up against our edges, in order to grow. That's why we choose, that's why some people choose to live in community. Um, and we do that psychologically, emotionally, but also behaviourally. You're, you're walking around a venue that's got 80 or 100 people in it. You're interacting, it's going on all around. Um, the psychologist John Rowan wrote about, um, and other people have talked about it too in more recent times, how for millennia human beings lived in small groups. Uh, usually no more than 150 people, and for millennia. 
And only in recent times have we lived in nuclear families in different arrangements and, and enormous cities. So there's something fundamental in our evolution around the size of a clan, a tribe, and so on. So I think it's interesting how these are in some ways replicating that. Um, some of you will know Irvin Yalom's ideas about groups. He, he postulated these um, in the 70s, um, and they have been researched quite a lot, and we know that groups, there is evidence to say that groups do a lot of these things, but this is what he, his ideas were that something about just being part of a cohesive group was a therapeutic experience. And when you, he wrote this for the general population, when you think about it for, through a queer lens, coming together and cohering is a, something of a miracle and has something of a miraculous effect on the brain. He talked about catharsis, so a space to relieve ourselves of feelings, just talking to each other, just sharing our stories, probably have your own experiences of what you'll share in a queer space in, compared to a normative space. For most people, it's their worlds apart, and we need those spaces, therefore. I've lumped three things together. Um, identification, normalization, and universality. So that mirrors of myself, seeing, oh, I feel like a bit like that, and oh, I don't feel like that but somehow we're in the same room, we're in the same community. And the, the psychological work that goes on with that. Normalization, again, really, I think really important for uh, almost all minorities. Um, but let's say with queer people, like we, we for so many years have felt odd, weird, separate, the only ones. And to suddenly find ourselves as part of the normal curve of a queer space. Is it, it does something to your neurobiology to do that. Interesting, I talked to somebody who recently uh, was diagnosed with synesthesia, which is a, a neuroatypical diversity. And they, they went to um, a, a big thing with a hundred other people with synesthesia. And for the first time in their life said, you know, I, 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 I reframed weird. I'm not weird. And I think we need these these collective experiences to reframe weird and to own legitimacy, validity as to who we are. Weird's great, nothing wrong with weird, but there's also something about not feeling weird sometimes. Um, universality, discovering the, the human truths underneath all the other layers that we pretty much all experience. And we find, that, we find those in these kinds of places. Self-understanding, uh, interpersonal learning, kind of obvious things that we get from being in groups and communities, intimate groups and communities. And uh, finally, one, the one I like the best, installation of hope, that it doesn't mean everyone leaves an event with, you know, radically changed, but most of us go away from a good collective event a little bit more hopeful about who we are in the world, who the community is in the world, what's possible, that seems to be part of a good group experience. I'm sure there's many other things that we could talk about, but those are some, some ideas that Irvin Yalom suggested a long time ago that I think hold true. So I want to almost finish with a quote from a Jungian analyst called Herman Bro, Harman Bro, um, which appears in a talk by Francis Weller, who's another psychotherapist. These images, there's three images, and they come from a, an article called Queer Space, Why They Are Important. The groundwork of good psychotherapy seems to me to be community. Since so much of therapy is confession, empowerment, transformation, and initiation, all of which have been done for centuries through the rites and disciplines of community, we would be crazy to ignore this. But the problem with the consulting room is precisely that it is low on community. We have to solve that one, whether through careful linkages to existing communities or building new ones. Fascinating line in terms of what, what I've just been describing, the building of new communities. There's a final forgiveness and a final authorization to risk that a therapist can't give, but a community can. Harman Bro quoted in a talk by Francis Weller. So just to finish up, 
a little advert for, no, not an advert, you obviously want to know what's coming up from providing that information. So the first one on the, on the left is uh, happening in November. It's an online on, on Zoom workshop. All of these events are for uh, gay and bi men and non-binary people who are attracted to men. Um, and anyone in that, in that zone that wants to come. So uh, this is called Love Comes Quietly. We're going to use a talk actually by Francis Weller, not the one that I just quoted, but a different one where he just talks really beautifully about love and relationship uh, in friendship as well as in intimate relationship, well, other intimate relationship. And uh, yeah, it just continues a conversation we've been having for 20 years. And so we'll be working with that and then we'll be working in smaller groups. Loving Men at New Year is our big event uh, happening over the New Year holidays, three days. Um, we have uh, bursaries available for people on low incomes. If you know people who are on low incomes who would benefit from this, we're really keen to use those bursaries for people who are, might be uh, intersecting with other identities, younger people, trans people, um, and, and people from the black and brown communities, particularly, it's, but it's open to anyone who uh, needs help with finan finances. Please pass that on to people. It's one of the hardest things to get that out there. And then uh, in January, we've got another online workshop called Opening Up, which is about enjoying your bum. Um, <laughs> Freud said the royal road to something was through the dreams. I think the royal road for a lot of gay men is through their anus and their relationship to their anus. And we need to talk about it and play with it and talk about it. And that's what we do online in the privacy of your own home. So thank you very much. Um, comments, questions, reflections? While you're thinking, oh yes, there's a person there, thank you. Hi, um, I'm a great advocate of ECC and I just got back from a week in August and again, my mind was blown, so thank you. But I have a question about your perspective about the age profile of people who go to these events. It strikes to me it's the same people going, and so we're all getting older and older, and I'm not seeing new people come. And I have the experience of past of working in a university counselling service. I found it incredibly hard to get young people to come to group work. It seems that perhaps it's the individualism of modern life. And as another observation, I was once talking in a group to a younger gay man, and he said, why did you need gay bars? And I was like, well, because how would you meet someone? Well, you just go online. So, is there something about the age profile changing? And maybe this was a need for our generation, A. And B, do younger people see themselves as part of a gay or queer or LGBT community? Or do they just think, I'm just me and I just go online if I want to have a shag? Um, I think some of these communities have exactly that phenomenon of, of the, as they age, as the people that started it age, uh, so do the people that, that go on it. Um, and there are some really interesting examples where, that's, where they have bucked that trend. So the stretch stuff in Berlin is very wide age range, including quite a lot of younger people. It's non-residential, so it's cheaper. It's in Berlin. Um, it has a different identity. Um, at Eastern Mountain, they run camps for younger people, and they, people go. They have to work at it, they get the fundraise for it. Um, I know Gendered Intelligence run a camp for young mm -hmm. trans people, very successful. Mm -hmm. So I think there are interventions, but I think the issues and the forces that you're talking about are also relevant. And, you know, the way Gen Z people think is very different from even even a decade up before that, and can't remember what they now call the ones after Gen Z. But, so we do need to think about uh, what their needs are and so on. We, at Loving Men, we have quite a nice range, although you know, it's true, there is a bit of a drift in that direction. Um, but there's always a few late 20s, early 30s that find their way, and some of them stay, and, and others come once or twice, and that's it. Mm. So I, I, I would encourage lots of creativity. I think there's something about the carpenter community that is a very interesting demographic, and that's that's what it is, you know, and it does it really well. So, yeah. But I, I mean, when we went to ECC events, we were young. Yeah. 
So we, we were some of the young ones at, that, at yeah. those events. And they were very special, that, that intergenerational thing, I think. Yeah. Was, was powerful friendships formed. So, yeah. It's a shame that, they, that they're not getting more younger ones coming now. I haven't been for decades because I'm too old. <laughs> Kaz has some questions. Kaz, thank you. Um, so the room just wanted, they wanted to thank you, but they also wanted me to reflect. This wonderful thing was happening as you were talking. The queer village inside the Zoom have all been sharing all the different groups and events that they know. Oh, wow. So there's been around 20 links going, oh, do you know about Quintimacy? Do you know about this? Do you know about that? So they've done exactly what you're talking about in microcosm this afternoon. We'll, we'll try and save that chat. I'm going to try. And... Yeah, and we'll put that out afterwards. That, that would be a very valuable resource. Thank you, online people. Thank you. I was going to add some of those myself. Um, one of which is Quintessential, that's existed since 2015. That's Queer Tantra. Um, and that certainly has included some people in the 20, 30 kind of mm. age group. And my experience of the Radical Fairies also includes people in that age group. Mm. And it's worth pointing out that it's, it's now more open to people of all genders and I think it's it's a really an interesting thing to do because it is also ecological and spiritual and a bit pagan and there's a lot of really lovely heart shares so it's a space where people can be very open and share so it's therapeutic in a sort of small t sense thank you thanks Mike. thank you and and they have a really radical model around finances so people pay what they can afford which is extraordinary, and, and I'm sure it's a key factor in why such a lot of young people are involved in the radical fair, amongst many others that you mentioned. Jim, thank you. I really enjoyed it. And, um, and, and your work is incredible. The amount of people you've touched yeah. is just amazing. And I run, I mean, I run some GSID group, therapy groups, as you know. I wanted if, if more if the encouragement from today from Dominic at the beginning from you is that more of us are reaching out to groups of people are pulling in you know queer community groups in whether it's group therapy or residential where's the training that you would recommend for that and what what do you think are the qualities needed for a therapist to move from an individual individualistic kind of therapeutic relationship to one that includes group and community Wow, enormous questions. Mm. Thank you. Um, um, there's not a lot of good group training in the UK. There are pockets of it. Uh, the Gestalt Centre do a reasonably good course um, somewhere else. Um, you were running a course yourself. Yeah, I run an intro weekend and Alfred and I are thinking about doing a certificate in group facilitation. Mm maybe at the end of next year it's like mm. we've been talking about it for a while and uh so so watch this space some of that might be happening uh the skill set is obviously you bring a lot from one-to-one -one work but it's a it's a big skill set it's a life it's a lifelong learning to run groups well um and you just have to start you just have to buy the books and read them and join a group um mm. i think learning how to read a room and learning how to support people to talk to each other rather than you be in dialogue with them is the biggest shift that we need to make. Um, and co-facilitation, ideally. Yeah, mm. oh, and especially if large group stuff, like a, a lovely representative team is the way to make this work. Mm. Um, co-facilitation is, is very helpful for mm. starting out, yeah. Thank you. I think we're gonna need to stop because we've got to keep going. Marco, I saw you with someone though. Is there a no? You're not. Great. Okay, so thank you, Tim, very much for that. Thank you. Thank you.